Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world in 30 Answers. Discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm in the heart of the Willamette Valley in Oregon, in McMinnville at Cote d'Ire Winery. I'm sitting with owner and winemaker Scott Neal. Scott, welcome, and tell us about Cote d'Ire. Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, having me on the podcast. So, Cote d'Ire Vineyard, we, my wife and I moved here 21 years ago and bought this, what was 50 acres at the time, of this beautiful blank hillside and started planting slowly as we could. Over the last 21 years, we've expanded a little bit. Um, We've got 92 acres now. We bought our neighbor's property. So about 40 acres under vine, grow organically. We've been uh, doing it all ourselves. We make the wine, we farm the property, we live here. We think it's actually very important to be on the land, in the land, and be part of it. Um, So that's really kind of our story. We make mostly Pinot Noir of the place. Our place has both sedimentary and volcanic soils, lots of different kind of textures and layers that really comes through in the wine. So yeah, it's exciting to be able to talk with you guys about what we do. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, tell me a little bit about the name of the winery, Cote de Terre. So, so Cote de Terre Vineyard. So it's kind of a long story. I'll, I'll try to truncate it a little <laughs> bit, but I grew up on a farm in Minnesota. And the whole idea of when we came out here is we wanted to get back to farming. We wanted to make something from the land. And at one point we'd gotten very much into Burgundies and it kind of led us to this pathway down to Oregon with Pinot Noir. So the farm I grew up on was called Lone Oak Farm in uh, Cannon Falls, Minnesota. And we were originally going to name it Lone Oak Estate, kind of the homage, if you will, back to um, home, back to where I grew up. And you know, at the time we were very busy. We we're planting a vineyard. I actually had another job. We were doing all sorts of stuff. Boy, my wife and I were running 24 hours a day. And I can be a little bit of a procrastinator. So my wife kept telling me, you know, we need to trademark that name and, and get on and, and do that. So I'd say, yeah, if we got to do that. You're right. And then I'd summarily forget to do it. And then so finally about six or nine months later, after we went through that discussion or kind of came up with that idea for the name, um, I got on the website, the government website to do that. And I typed in Lone Oak and wine and thinking, okay, I'll just you know hit the button and we'll, we'll get the name. And it said, sorry, Robert Mondavi trademarked the name <laughs> three weeks ago. So I'm like, okay, well, that's a sign that, 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 that I'm not very smart. Um, but so then, uh, luckily my wife's very, yeah, um, I guess takes it easy on me and said, that's, that's fine. You know, what we need to do really, and really what we should be doing is let the land name itself. So, um, we decided that we we're going to walk the land, just kind of be here and ultimately the name would just come to us, right? The land would reveal its name to us itself. So, uh, so we're walking along down by the pond, which you can see through the window here. Um, and there was this heart shaped rock about, I don't know, about a foot by a foot wide sticking out of the earth, this heart shaped kind of piece of rock. And, um, my wife had collected heart shaped rocks kind of, you know, just as a, a side, you know, from the beaches or whatever. And she looked down and said, look, it's heart shaped. And it's heart of it's in the earth, the heart of the earth, and it's right by the first planting of the block where we first planted our first grapes, Rennell's block. And we're like, maybe this is it. And so then I, you know, it's heart of the earth. I googled um, uh, heart of the earth and kind of looked at the French translation and all this kind of thing. And not that we make French wines, not that we are French in any way, except being inspired <laughs> by Burgundy. So, and, and we try to kind of follow, I think, maybe a little bit of a, a more traditional ethos. So it came up as Corte de Terre, and we thought that sounded pretty good, and that was kind of the name of the, the place, came yeah. from that. And the story goes a little bit further to show my uh-huh. how I'm not always attentive to everything, is at one point we had this little tiny John Deere tractor. So when we moved here, we had absolutely no money. We uh, spent every nickel we had to buy the land, uh, and then I had to, I remember I got a loan for this old John Deere tractor, $5,000 loan for this original John Deere tractor that we had. And it was tiny, but it had a bucket on it. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to dig this out to see how big it is. And so I kept digging and it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm like, it's, it's not the heart of the earth. It, it is the earth. It's attached. So, so I gave up and just said, well, it's just going to be a little, you know, shrine down there to, to, to core to tear this whole thing in the earth. And then, uh, we're putting a road in. So this was before we had our road up to the top of the hill, putting our road in and the guy who was putting it in before him, my wife said, make sure he doesn't touch our rock. That's our name. 
Well, you can probably guess what I did. I forgot to tell him. <laughs> so, so I forgot to tell Don Rizzo that、um, did not touch our rock. So at the end, Don says, Scott. He called me up. Scott, I, I got your your road done, and that rock you tried to get out, I got it out for you. What do you want me to do? And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm in so much trouble. I'm like, We're going to put it exactly back the way you found it. And I get down there, and it's an eight foot tall heart shaped boulder sitting there in front of the hill. And I was like, man, I am the luckiest man on the planet. Yeah. So、um, it's almost like you planned it. <laughs> it was fate, is what it was. And, and actually, when that happened, I really had this like feeling like I don't know, there's something more going on. Like I'm not this lucky. So whatever was looking out for me at that point,、um, there's this eight foot heart shaped, eight foot tall heart shaped boulder that's both、uh, it's volcanic based, but it's also encrusted with siltstone. Which is what our property has, both volcanic and siltstone, and sandstone, our, our sedimentary soils as part of our place, very representative of us. It's this huge boulder that's、uh, sitting there as kind of our namesake. And so it's no joke that、um, you let the land speak to you. Oh, there's there's no doubt about it. And like <laughs> I said, it was it was more than just luck. Yeah. So I don't know. How much more? So, with that beautiful story, and then with the vineyards that you have planted here, and you said primarily Pinot Noir, how much wine are you making, and where is your wine available? Yep. So、uh, we have about five thousand、mm-hmm. cases is what we make a year. You know that varies depend upon vintage,、um, and our wines are. Available at cdtvineyard dot com, which we love to sell it that way. I can tell you that that is my my my、uh, shameless shill for selling wine,、uh, but also available、um, in Oregon, Washington, California, Minnesota, Chicago, Illinois, D.C., Virginia, Maryland, Georgia, Connecticut, Vermont.、Oh. I think got all your states down. <laughs> I think so. So, Scott, tell me, what is your first memory relevant to wine? My first memory relevant to wine is、um, not necessarily a great one. I can tell you that <laughs> it was.、Uh, so I grew up on a farm in Minnesota, and I can assure you that farmers in Minnesota don't drink great wine. That that may have changed, but when I was a kid, it was not the case. So my first thought of wine was wine was that stuff that came in a big gallon jug with a thumb handle and a you know big screw top like a mason jar, <laughs> and and it usually would be sitting in the fridge for about. Four months, you might drink a little bit on Thanksgiving, but then it would go right back in. So it was that stuff that would go in there and smell a lot like the vinegar that was in in somewhere in in the kitchen as well, and it was never that good. So that was my first thought of wine. And、uh, so the jug wine didn't actually turn you off entirely, or or was there a more memorable experience that kind of led you down the path of a wine drinker? Yeah, certainly there was a more memorable experience、um, that led me down the path. So.、Um, It almost turned me off. I can tell you that I was very much、um, not a wine drinker when I was young.、Um, when I was in college, I started brewing beer myself, and and so I was kind of fermenting things, and I and I really liked good beer at the time.、Um, and then I was working for a company after after college, and a, a friend of mine was working there, and he kept ta- he was a very much a wine lover, and he would talk about wine. I'd be like, No, no, that's that stuff that doesn't taste very good, and it smells weird, and Uh, so I was very much against it, and then you know one day he said, "No, no, we're going to sit down and drink some wine," and he pulled out a、um, a Cabernet Stag's Leap Cast Twenty Three, nineteen eighty seven, and opened that bottle and I tasted it. And I was like, "This is not the wine that I remember," <laughs> and it was it was a pretty amazing wine. So、um, that started the path. So you know, I, I often say I'm not a big Cabernet drinker, but Cabernet was the original wine that. Led me to where we are today, and then as we got into drinking more wine,、um, we kind of started looking around and, and seeing what was out there. And I think at one point we crossed Burgundy's path, or Burgundy's path crossed ours, and we tasted Burgundy, and it all just kind of seemed like that was the path and the place and the wine that we wanted to to try to make.、Oh. That's a great story, and now that you've、um, disclosed all the stories about all the procrastination and mess ups <laughs> of the winery, and now we can introduce your wife, Lisa, who has joined us. He's already disclosed all the mistakes he made that worked out for the best. I, so <laughs> I haven't disclosed all the mistakes. I've just disclosed some of the mistakes, and yes, and God, and God bless her patience. All that's all I can say. 
But Lisa, uh, welcome and tell us what's one of your first memories about wine and as a wine drinker. Yeah, so, you know, I grew up in Colorado and on my big adventure after leaving Colorado, kind of exploring the East Coast, I landed one of my first jobs was with a distributor and not because I said, "Hey, I want to work for a distributor or work in the the beer and alcohol business." but because it was, you know, running the gauntlet of interviews and it was the first job offered to me. So it was a little bit of happenstance. And while I was in the D.C. area, I got to become friends with uh, several people at Foreman, which they handled the finer imported wines. And so on occasion, I would have the opportunity to get invited to something where I would be able to taste wines I would never be able to afford. And that was kind of my introduction to it. I knew I wanted to be a part of the wine industry. I just wasn't sure in what capacity. So I came back to Colorado to kind of drown in the fountain of family, per se, which means to mooch off of them until you can come up with your next steps. And uh, I had planned on moving to the West Coast, but then I crossed paths with Scott. And Scott was a Minnesota farm boy who, you know, had had his day job but was brewing beer in his basement and he had you know written a whole software program for mash temperatures and times hooked up to this rigged cooler in his basement and I was like you are such a geek I think I want to marry you <laughs> so um you know our paths crossed and we ended up I ended up staying in Colorado a little bit longer and then uh you know a couple of years longer actually And after shortly getting married, um, you know, I think we both kind of looked at each other and realized that the game of, you know, life, the way that it, you know, the path that it had gone to that point was not really for us. You know, sitting in suburbia, uh, you know, working the day jobs, not really sure, you know, did it really feed us on a deeper level? And so we started the march and it was actually my parents had good friends who bought us a wine of the month club and they would send us you know every month we would get six bottles of wine and a lot of those were Oregon wines and so uh not only that but then you know we started to to plan visits we had friends that were in the Berkeley area and when we would go there it would you know of course you get enamored with the you know the the romance of it oh it looks so beautiful But you know obviously that wasn't viable for us. We you know we are that rare story where we sold our little starter track house for $135,000 in Colorado and bought 50 acres in Oregon and leveraged ourselves to the hilt and back then you know you could buy 50 acres not to say that it was advertised as prime vineyard potential but this piece of property was $252,000 at that time and if we wow. had to play at today's numbers there's no way and both of us kind of come from a similar background our roots interestingly are very intertwined in how our ancestry was how they grew up. He, you know, his grandfather was a rancher in Oklahoma and my grandmother's family were were farmers not very far from where his grandfather was. In fact, when we had our our, our uh, kind of uh, engagement party, it was like I had this moment of looking at him going, "Please don't tell me we're related." <laughs> But, you know, this this mindset of of doing what it takes to get things done, that it's not a 40-hour week, that if you've got something that you really want in your life you work harder than 40 hours and try to fit 2 hours in the in in you know per hour that you do that you're given in a day. And so that's kind of where we jumped off this cliff together and it had everything to do with why we grafted our own vines, why we have always only ever managed our own vineyard and continue to do so. Scott, you know, and had made uh, wine with Scott Shoal. Scott Shoal had kind of brought him under his wing for one or two vintages and then Scott took it over from that point forward and so we've never been those people that have just you know let's have somebody else do it for us one Scott is Scottish so that means it's extremely <laughs> cheap so but that served us well because we didn't have the we didn't have the equity to throw into it at that time and of course things have evolved for us now so so you obviously have spent some time traveling and getting into wine and drinking other wines as they kind of fell into your Wine of the Month Club. Traveling abroad, what's one of the is Burgundy really the place your favorite place or are there other regions of the world that sort of inspire you? I mean, for me, I think that we've only really at least for me, I've only ever really visited those areas that are prime or or premium uh Pinot Noir 
growing regions. And so obviously Burgundy we have visited. We've also been to New Zealand, the South Island, which is also really lovely. Being here in this valley, we have this incredible event every year, which is the International Pinot Noir Celebration. And we've participated in that in one way or another for several years, and even before that in, in attending it or volunteering for it. You know, so we've been able to taste Pinot Noirs from Tasmania, from Germany, you know, from all over the world, which has been such a gift to us. We have visited Italy, you know, for whatever reason, I'm a firm believer that, you know, the wines have so much to do with the experience. You know, that, that, that you know, you're sitting there and you're eating house-made salumi and, you know, enjoying the house-made olives and then the house-made wine, you know, does it make it to, you know, the, the list? Maybe not, <laughs> but it's some of the best wine you've ever tasted because of the experience of it. So if we were to come to your home and enter your cellar, what would we find in there? And anything in particular drinking really well right now? Oh. Yeah, so you'll, you'll certainly find a lot of Oregon wine. Um, yeah, some people could accuse us of having cellar palate, I would, I would say. But outside of, and, and Burgundies, um, I'd like to have more of those, that's for sure. <laughs> wouldn't uh, we all? Yeah, wouldn't we all? <laughs> but I'd say that there's not, it, there's not a small amount of Northern Rhone wines as well. I definitely enjoy the Northern Rhone, San Josef down to Cornas kind of Hermitage. You know, if we can get those as well. Those wines, uh, I'd say we have some Piemonte, some, some wines from the northern Italy as well. So typically where we tend to have our wines, I'd say in general that we enjoy are ones that are more on the cooler climate, on the cooler side. So where, you know, wines are more on the edge of ripening versus being you know, pretty far down the pipeline of ripeness. So in general, that's, I'd say, where we have most of our wines. Um, some Austrian wines from Whites. Certainly Alsatian wines as well. A nice good smattering of wines. Do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? Pinot Noir. Uh, <laughs> I think it's tough. I think that there's so, there's, you know, there, to me, I think as I've aged um, and kind of, well, not aged, matured. As I've matured, right? right? <laughs> as I've matured, I think that what I'm realizing is that um, there's, so many incredible varietals that we don't really even dive into. Um, and when, you know, for instance, Frasca's in Boulder attending a dinner there that was pretty special in the sommelier, uh, they had these really unique varietals from Italy, it had some incredible Gruner Belt leaners. And when they brought the wines out from Italy to taste individually, you know, they, they seemed hugely flawed in mm -hmm. many ways. But then the chef brought out what was intended to be paired with that, and they were beautiful. Um, I think that there's so many beautiful places on the table for so many different varietals. And we've all been in that situation where we've had, you know, that bite of something and that sip of Gewürztraminer or that sip of, you know, Sauvignon Blanc or, you know, whatever, whatever the varietal might be or the vintage might be where it just, it's this ol olfactory, you know, explosion in, in the mind and on the palate and it's, it's, so I think there's room for everything at the table. Wine Soundtrack, the voice of American wine growers and makers. The reason I, would, I said Pinot Noir, though, is, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is um, yeah, obviously we're biased, and I, I will be the first to admit that. But, which you're allowed to be. Yeah, which we're very much allowed to be, uh, is that Pinot Noir, from a production standpoint, from a, a, a producing a wine, why I think it's greatest varietal is it shows where and how it was grown unlike any other grape. So a Pinot Noir that comes from Corte de Terre will be unlike any other Pinot Noir from the world because it's from here. It's different than our neighbor's place because it's different soil, it's different exposure, different elevation. And the way Pinot Noir translates that place into the bottle really can only be maybe matched by Riesling, in my opinion. And that's, to me, why Pinot Noir, you know, to say it's the perfect varietal is not true because it's very difficult to make, it's very difficult to grow, it can only grow in certain spots. But when it's made well, 
it can transcend and, and show that place in that time and place, unlike anything else. Well, so Lisa, you were talking also about, you know, sometimes a wine will show better when it's paired with food. How do you two approach food and wine pairing? Um, do you follow the rules of white wine and fish, red wine and meat? Do you think there are hard and fast rules or kind of loosey-goosey? What, how do you guys approach it? You know, I have been blown away by the incredible chefs that we have here in the Valley. And, you know, one, for instance, who's also become, you know, uh, endearing in our lives for many reasons, but uh, Andrew Garrison came and did a, a lunch here uh, last summer and he paired our Syrah with dessert. Never would have expected that when I saw it on the menu. What I've learned is to trust our chefs that are here in the Valley because they are top notch. They come from outside of the box. So they're, they're moving through and playing around with flavors in a way that are very unexpected, but so very welcome. And so I've learned to kind of throw a lot of the rules <laughs> out and start just following some of the things that they're doing right now at, during the International Pinot Noir celebration. Ryan at um, Quantrell was our chef here. He paired grilled lamb and grilled peaches, but he added in this incredible chili heat underneath that then was paired with the Syrah. So it's interesting to see how they're starting to really dive deep into the flavors and get out of, I think, you know, kind of like the, I, I don't want to be offensive in any way, but like the Better Homes and Gardens, old, which <laughs> I reference that cookbook still to this day, but you know, the Better Homes and Gardens cookbook, you yes. know, that kind of catch-all 101 cooking of, yes, you pair white wines with fish. <laughs> So I think there's so many beautiful things that are out there that you can tap into. And hopefully while you're in the Valley, you'll experience that as well. It's unique. Absolutely. What's your opinion on wine critics and scores? <laughs> <laughs> it's really fantastic when they're giving you, like, for instance, we just received some incredible scores uh, that, of course, we'll be shouting from the rooftops. But, you know, I, I think that... I don't know. I have tasted wines that have received incredible reviews and not from our peers here in the Valley, but, you know, primarily these Italians that were, then when you open them up once again, you, you taste them, you know, they, they have pediococcus. They're, they're, they are flawed in many ways, but yet they're rated so very high. And not to say that that hurts you, because if you pair that with something really unique it once again it comes together mm -hmm. in on the palate and so i think i think you love them when they love you and you know when you're not getting rated or you're trying to get behind the velvet rope or they rate you but maybe not as highly as you thought then yeah, i mean it's a challenge i've heard them i've heard the panels i think they struggle with the scoring system they talk about how it's consumer driven consumers really want the scores when people are here in the tasting room, though, what I say is you drink what you like. I think you really need to find what you like and that nobody should be dictating what that is. If you if you like a sweeter Riesling, then you should definitely move toward that. That's something that, you know, because that's the experience of wine. And I don't think anybody should be dictating to anybody else, you know, really, this is what you should be. You should be pairing this wine with this. And sure. you should really, you know, oh, you know, sweet Rieslings are for your grandmother. Dry Rieslings are where everything is at. It's, you know, I think that's silly. Yeah. So Scott, you've been a little quiet there yeah. on critics. Yeah, yeah. What, what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say about, about scores is I, I think that it is a, a, a good generality for folks, for people to look at and maybe to guide them on their decision. First of all, they do have to realize it is typically one person's palate. Um, and maybe over the last 20 years, you could say that wines have changed because of certain drivers in the industry have changed maybe what people's perception of what a good wine is. But I think... What people should do from a score perspective is not look at like, oh, that one got a 94 and that one got a 93. So that one's one point better. I, I really don't think that it can be that granular. I think if a wine maybe from several wine critics gets a 70, well, you might think that that's probably maybe not a great wine. If it gets a balance of a whole bunch of folks saying that it's somewhere in the high 80s to 90s, well, maybe it's something you want to try and give it a shot and see what it's like. The guys that are pursuing that, oh, that's that 100 point wine and that's the only wine I'll drink and that kind of stuff, I, I think they're missing a huge piece of the world um, because it's more of a prestige thing that you're going after when you're looking at that versus um, maybe looking at the more of the, the whole piece of the puzzle. So anyway, that would be my thing is you look at it more in a generality in my opinion and 
use that as a baseline. If you find a reviewer that you've tasted their wines that they rank high that you like, well, maybe that's a good baseline for you. But just don't take this guy's in a big magazine. He gave it a 94. I have no idea who this person is. So somehow that's better than the 92 point wine that's there or the 89 point wine. It's just whatever perception they had was different. They both probably are very excellent in many ways. And it's really a matter of what that individual person likes. Right. Because it really is personal opinion. So I'm going to ask you guys a question on personal opinion. Okay. Quick answers. Red, white, or rosé? Rosé. <sighs> Red. <laughs> Still or sparkling? Sparkling. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, how do you, why do you have to choose? <laughs> That's my answer. Right. <laughs> the decadence of it all. You, know. you don't have to choose, really. I'm not really. going to. I think they're, they're both perfect in many ways. Um, what do you think that someone who hasn't tasted your wine is missing out on? I think it's the experience. You know, I think that, uh, you know, certainly you can find us in some states and you can find us on the shelf, some in restaurants. But, you know, it's, I think, kind of getting back to the, the previous question of, you know, the scores and everything. I think the consumer needs to get out and visit these regions and taste the wines. And, you know, the, the beauty of Corte de Terre is when you come here and you experience tasting the wine on the soils while you're sitting, you know, in the soils, in the, in the vineyard, uh, to be able to really understand what, what is the geology transferring through to the finished product and, and become educated in, in that realm, but then to enjoy the overall experience of being in the farm, you know, in the winery while you're tasting the wine. So that's what I think my point was, is people should get out and taste more and visit these regions uh, rather than just going by scores because there's so many beautiful, beautiful hidden gems, not just obviously in our valley, but we found many on our trips where you decide to take the left instead of the right and go, you know, down that gravel road. And the next thing you know is there's this beautiful authenticity mm -hmm. and integrity that's being provided, not just from the growing uh, but uh, that translates all the way through to the finished product. In the right. But what, your finished product, what do you think someone has missed out on by not having yours? Yeah, so, so what I would say is, so, so first of all, the Willamette Valley is a very special place. Um, and and it's, it's very unique in the fact that um, we have a, an amazing group of people who are really focused on quality, focused on making wines that are um, not necessarily, boy, that's going to fit a shelf spot or it's going to do this kind of marketing thing but it's going to be the best Pinot Noir we can get off our place. So that's certainly what we're focused on, is we're trying to make a wine that represents our place. So, you know, specifically what they're missing out on, again, like I said before, they will never have another Pinot Noir like ours because it's not from here. We're the only ones who make grapes off of, wine off of these grapes. And it has a special vibrancy, a special um, sense of place. That being said, to really understand that, they need to be going to other places in Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, to be able to see that. Because those places all have their own special vibe, too. And to really know what you're seeing at Corte Terre is you have to have a, a relationship to other wines to see that juxtaposition. That's what I would say. So when they come here and they taste the heart of the earth... Um, as the winery is here. If space aliens were to land on your property, which of your wines would you want to introduce them to? Oh, I think definitely our block designates. Our block designates are, the, I think, the true gem of Corte de Terre. Uh, stones throw, these blocks are located. We've planted the blocks in all the soil selection, meaning as diverse of plant material as possible so that we could really clearly be able to uh, understand what's happening beneath the soil. And so to taste these four blocks side by side, compare and contrast, stones throw, so same vintage, same general French oak profile, same winemaker, distinctly different wines. And that's the earth. That's the earth speaking and sending through, you know, these ancient marine sedimentary soils on the lower elevations and these ancient marine volcanic soil. So this is volcanic material created at the bottom of the ocean, mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing, you know, to think that there's this upheaval. Our volcanic soils are very different from anybody else's volcanic soils. And so it's, there's, there's a beauty and a gift in that that I think translates through in this block designate. So. Yeah, and what I would say is, uh, as always, I agree with my wife. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> so um, when we started, Scott, you were telling me that you farm organically and you said that when you were picking the name for the winery that you were, you know, going to let the land speak to itself. Um, do you speak to your grapes in response? And if so, um, what do you what do you say to your grapes when you're walking through the vineyards? Or, or when they're in barrel. So I don't, I don't probably physically speak to my grapes um, out loud, um, and except maybe certain times I, <laughs> I have said some things out in the vineyard. But I actually think it is a conversation. Um, growing grapes and making the wine is not a, a one direction thing. And in fact, I think you, you get very lost if you do that. Um, whereas like I'm going to dictate to this wine what it's going to be. But in fact, the, the best way to make wine is when you listen to what the wine's telling you and respond and actually, in a lot of cases, don't do anything, don't respond. Um, and I say a lot of times is winemaking, one of the hardest things to do is to let the wine be because there's always some um, machine or additive or technology or something you're, you know, that the folks back in, in academia would tell you you could do or in industry. But the best wines are made when you are as minimal as you can be. So, you know, I think from a vineyard perspective, that's one thing we try to do is we try to be doing minimal inputs. But I'd say we're actually in the vineyard, we're pretty maximum effort. We're out in the vineyard a lot. We're doing a lot of hand work. We're in the vineyard every single day. So to say we're minimalists in the vineyard would not be true, except from the fact of inputs, you know, what we're trying to do. So we're trying to, you know, like spray wise, we're trying to be as, as we, we have to manage for powdery mildew and botrytis basically. Um, and we're trying to do as little as we can to make that happen and doing as many mechanical type things that we can. Um, chew position, canopy, open, that kind of thing, making sure we're, we're, we're having a balanced vine. Um, and, and looking at weather models to miss sprays we can and, and all sorts of different things. I'm actually looking at a whole bunch of different stuff. So I, I love actually the application of technology in the vineyard, I think is, is really exciting. Um, we're doing aerial imaging of our vineyard every week, looking at the vigor and using it uses these four image spectral cameras and we're imaging to see what's happening vine by vine in our vineyard. And what I want to do is start implementing more responses to that, looking at our vineyard guys and making decisions in the vineyard based upon what's happening exactly based on this vigor, this, these overhead maps. Um, I was just talking with Lisa this morning about hooking our sprayer so that it modulates the spray. So in areas that don't have disease pressure, it turns off because that's the most organic and least impactful thing you can do is nothing and let the, you know, the environment create a healthy environment and let that be the driver of what makes healthy fruit. Um, so yeah, that. well, as, assuming you have a healthy environment, how much um, do you see vintage playing a role? We know that there's vintage variation, but do you find that there's more commonality year to year or more variation year to year? Well, I mean, I think that we've seen, uh, you know, especially with these warmer vintages, there's some consistency. It just allows me to even better embrace these cooler vintages because I think they are going to be, you know, nobody has the crystal ball, but the, you know, just from our short time of being here, it seems like they're far and fewer between. Um, and I'm a cool climber girl but um, I think that uh, you know definitely the gift of Scott in my opinion and the gift of the vineyard you know like getting back to what it, you know what what do we say to the grapes it's really greater than that I'm a firm believer that what translates into the bottle is really touched by everybody that it works for us so when we start talking about sustainability and organic practices how do we treat our employees we have long-term employees that stay for long periods of time because we treat them well they work happy here so as they're touching the grapes and their shoot positioning and they're moving through and helping us with punch downs and different things all of that is transferred energy in my opinion that hopefully translates through to a, a bottle of integrity a product of integrity but getting back to the vintages i think that's the gift to scott is that he's he's proud to show the vintage it's not about kicking out the same wine over and over, which some of these producers that are 850,000 cases or more, absolutely it makes sense that, you know, if you're going to buy their product on the West Coast or the East Coast, you know, in these restaurants, same restaurants, they need to taste consistently the same from vintage to vintage. For us, that's the gift of being small. 
is that we don't have to taste the same. And it's the gift of us as we can become this beautiful tool in education to those that are interested. What does cool climate viticulture and, you know, uh, partake in the process of the finished product? What are these warmer vintages and how does that translate? We can go back and open warmer vintages to determine how do warmer vintages age? How do the cooler vintages age comparing and contrasting? So, um, so you said you have a team of loyal people that come back time to time. Do you have any um, traditions um, that you do at the beginning of harvest as a team? Oh, obviously, yeah. So we have a dear friend who comes and cooks for the crews always. Um, there's no big ceremony. The ceremony of it is is when all of the activity starts to happen and you know, up at the crack of dawn, you know, and and down in the cellar late at night. It's there's this, there's this, but there's this coming together as a, our small community where people who work in the tasting mm-hmm. room sorting fruit, um, and if they're interested in coming down, that they're learning about the process and really getting their hands into the musk. But it's about being fed well and opening library lines <laughs> and opening some of these rare gems that you know maybe we're sitting on in the cellar, cracking them open and saying, "Hey, what do you think about this?" And um, because it really is, you know, it's such a gift to be in, in, engaged or have our, you know, have our job be the wine industry. And so to be able to, you know, pull our entire team, all of the vineyards. So we all sit around this big table and have these incredible meals. And then we get up and we get to the, <laughs> get to the business of making wine. Back to work. Is, yeah. So um, when you were little, what did each of you want to be when you grew up? Oh gosh, I think I wanted to be helping indigenous people in the jungles, like, you know, find clean water and, you know, improve their living conditions is what my dream was. And I guess that would be anthropology or... I want to be Neil Armstrong. Oh, walk the <laughs> earth. Um, walk on the moon. Yes. <laughs> and um, how do you guys spend your free time when you're, I mean, you obviously eat, breathe and sleep the vineyard. Do you have free time? <laughs> Yeah, free time. Uh, free time. Uh, you know, it's it's with our children. Yeah. We're we're about family. My children come first, and so if we're not working at the winery, we're spending time with our children. Um, you know, we we do we cook all of our meals together. We you know we play music together. There's a lot that we do that you know, and that there is a greater gift than even you know what we experience here in the industry. Are they working in the winery as well? They do. Yeah. yeah. So I've got I've got our 16 year old doing winery compliance right now. So I'm I'm afraid that I'm like running like her poisoning off. her to the entire industry. But and the 11 year old comes down. So Tallulah comes down and helps with punch downs, and she 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 gets pulled out of school when it's time to pick her her block and uh this past year she picked two full rolls by herself yeah. wow yeah so she's you know there's it's absolutely it's a it's a family business and so on those rare occasions that you get a romantic evening what are the wines that you'd be opening for that romantic evening? The last meal that we had, well, I mean, it was, or- they were Oregon wines. Yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, I think when we do special occasions at the, yeah, we open some champagnes, some grower champagnes, and, you know, we'll open up some uh, German Riesling. Uh, you know, there'll be some Gruner Beltliners that we might pop open. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it just depends. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's definitely a party starts with bubbles. No doubt about it, from champagne. Yeah, uh, from, well. a, from a good grower's champagne somewhere. <laughs> in, in. So, um, looking back, what would you say is your a proudest achievement to date in your work? I mean, obviously, you've achieved a lot, but is there one thing that stands out? I think that, that we've survived. That's exactly what I <laughs> you know, and, and that is in so, many, in so many levels. You know, we did not just cash in stocks and say, gee, I'd really like to see my name on a bottle. We literally jumped off this cliff and leveraged ourselves to the hilt. And, you know, my sister and I laid the wood floors here in the winery. You know, when we when we, we, we grafted our own vines, we created the plant material that's here on the site. Um, and to say that it was us, it was us and a small team of people. It's a small team that we have for us now. It's always been a small team. But we, we never had the luxury of writing the big check and saying, you know. So to be able to survive 
um, you know, to be in the industry that will be going on our 21st year this coming August and to, you know, relatively recently be invited behind the velvet rope, so to speak, you know, because, you know, it takes a lot to get to build a name in the industry and um, especially when you do it our way. But the hard work and the fact that we've survived and that we've stayed, I think, is our great accomplishment. And, and stayed true to what we originally believed yeah. in. And, and I really do believe that, that we stayed true and honest to our original idea of making this about the place and making it about something bigger than us. This wasn't about, you know, some, you know, boy, I want to have a bottle and have, you know, show it to my friends. This is more about having, creating a, a place that we could have a life that would be meaningful. Uh, remind me your total case production? About 5,000 cases. 5,000 cases. So obviously you've had a lot of great advice given to you over the years. Is there one piece of advice that has really um, kind of stood with you the whole time? And can you share that with us? Oh, my God. Well, I, I know the one that, that sticks out of my head right away <laughs> is when we were about the second year in, we went to an Oregon wine growers meeting, and Myron Redford from Amity Vineyard was there. And he's like, are you guys crazy? Well, do, you know, <laughs> do you know how hard this business is? Do you know how many divorces happen because of the, or, uh, because of, of the wine industry? Are you guys sure about this? And, um, you know, so it's advice we didn't heed, um, <laughs> but I, and, and Myron has been a great friend from that point on because of that beauty of the way he speaks honestly. Mm -hmm. And he's so Oregonian. He's just perfect in that way. Um, was a, a, though a cautionary tale that you, there's more to it, right? That, it, that you've got to be careful, um, which I'm not always, sometimes it can be consuming. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a tale that you have to continue to, to heed, I think. Well, and to your proudest achievement of surviving, I think you heeded it <laughs> quite well. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> is there a piece of advice that um, has stuck with you over the you years? You know, and this is the one that I just always go back to, and it's, uh, it's advice that actually my mother-in-law, mm -hmm. who our oldest block, <laughs> was dedicated uh -huh. uh, to her. Um, she stood and offered advice that, you know, marriage is, um, is never 50-50, you know, sometimes it's 80 20 and not in your favor but as you stick to it and as you work through it then you get to enjoy the beautiful gifts that come with that experience and so I feel that that's not just been our marriage it's been our work relationship but it's also been I think in my opinion our relationship with the, with the wine industry as well is that sometimes it's 80 20 and in your favor and you're getting great scores and you're kind of riding the wave and then sometimes it's not in your favor and so but it's learning to just know that by sticking through it and knowing that you're 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 sticking to your core values and what your integrity is and what your your choices are with your farming practices that you don't compromise on what your core values are that gets you through it so so um, complete the sentence for me. Let's see if you both can go quickly without, you know, relying on the other person. A table without wine is like... <laughs> I can't even imagine. I, I didn't even know imagine. there was such a thing. <laughs> it's like, I, it's, uh, uh, like a uh, day without sunshine. I don't know. What's, it's a little too trite. Um, Trite's okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just not right. Yeah. So... If you could imagine a scenario where somebody is sitting at a table in a restaurant with a bottle of your wine on the table and the paparazzi, you know, capture that, who would you want to be that person drinking your wine? It can be famous or not famous, living or not living, but who would you want to see with that, captured with that bottle of Cote de Terre? Oh, um, for me, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but Bryce Bagnall, who um, he was Bryce Vineyards. He was one of the truly beautiful gems of this valley. When we arrived and knew nothing and were really nobody, he kind of took us under his wing and his generosity of time and energy and love. You know, I remember we were pouring our wine at a local bakery and he, this is when his disease had really kind of set in and he was heading to dinner with friends, but he saw our sign and he took a left <laughs> and he came in and he had a conversation with us. And so I would love to have that picture of Bryce sitting there enjoying a bottle of our wine. And um, that would just, that would just be wonderful for me. Okay, beat that one. 
I, I, that's, I, that's a beautiful I, I don't believe that there's possible to beat that one. And frank, frankly, now that she said it, that's all I can think about. It, it, it really, that would be amazing. I, I would not have thought about that. But Bryce was an amazing person. I mean, like Lisa said, that, that day that she's alluding to, we were, it was our first wine, really, that, and we were pouring it at this bakery. And, and he was, you know, not in the best shape at the time, but he took time out of his day to come see us and be very kind and was amazing. He always was though. He was the winemaker at Witness Tree and then he broke off and, and finally, I think in his career, was able to scrape the pennies together to buy his land. And so he had that small lot of a vineyard and he invited us, you know, like as a group, he invited a lot of people to come up and like, hey, walk with us. He was so excited about it. And, um, you know, but a truly great winemaker. We still have some Bryce in our yeah. cellar, which, you know, we'll <laughs> so, have to open up and see if that's drinking well, but I should have referenced <laughs> Like I love, yeah. Well, talking about wines in your cellar or wines that you like to drink, if you're being sent off to a deserted island, it is your island of choice in terms of temperature and amenities. But what three wines would you take with you? Oh, I mean, I love our Rosé Rustique, uh, which is a Syrah blend, a state, all estate grown. Um, we've got Cool Clement Syrah here on the property. Um, definitely, I would bring Winnell's Block, the block that was dedicated to my mother-in-law. And, um, you know, I think the Riesling is really quite phenomenal. So those are Lisa's really a real loyalist. She takes she, only your wine. Yeah, I, know, I, know so. I, was, I was thinking about maybe a DRC might be in the, uh, in the mix there somewhere. Well, the good thing is if you go to the island together. Right, right. We have six wines, six right? Wines. All right, well, I'm, I'm picking Burgundies then. Uh, I'm picking some, um, some Grand Cru, some uh, DRCs, I think. Uh, I'd probably bring some, uh, some uh, white Burgundy as well. Mm-hmm. And so, your third one? My third one. Wow. Um, so I would bring some Barolo. Okay. What? No carotene? <laughs> I know, right? Okay, change that. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to bring some Hermitage, too. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, fortunately, you'll get to take a lot more wines. <laughs> um, we're almost finished, but we play a little game at Wine Soundtrack because we like to talk about the wines we talked about and then pair them excuse me, with music, um, since music does play such a role in, in wine and, and what we do. Of the wines that you would take to your deserted island, uh, tell me what kind of music you'd want to be listening to or makes you think of. So let's start with your Rosé of Syrah. Oh, wow. So it's got that pepper and spice. Uh, you know, I think definitely Led Zeppelin would need to come with the Syrah or the, the Rosé Rustique, which is the Syrah blend Rosé. Okay. I was thinking the Clash or the Replacements on that one, too. Oh, yeah. The so. Clue, yeah. So something a little, yeah. Yeah, it's a little punk. Yeah. <laughs> and your mother-in-law's um, block of Pinot Noir? Wow. So Rennell's block, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh I think that, you know, that would be really a little bit more difficult. You know, she was salt of the earth. I I think definitely Bob Dylan would have to come through because of the salt of the earth and her quality and integrity of uh, overall her, like, you know, her, her moral compass was just always spot on. So yeah, Bob Dylan is what I would bring. So, so she loved Elvis. So (laughs) so that's, that's one reason I would probably bring Elvis's gold records because we completely destroyed that album when I was a kid because we listen to it every single day um the one that just comes to my mind about my mom is the beatles because they were so amazing from in different layers and levels and so was my mom she was amazing in so many levels that's fantastic i mean i'm trying to think of another wine and music but i think that's such a nice sentiment i'm gonna leave it there (laughs) so with the world of wine at your fingertips, what one wine region is at the top of your bucket list to go explore next? Yeah, you know, after tasting those Tasmanian Pinot Noirs, I had no idea. And to listen to how they are just on the edge of the world, I like. I love a challenge, and I think there's great beauty in things that can be created. So I either Tasmania or we also tasted the Canadian um, up Nova Scotia. They're growing some Pinot Noir in Nova Scotia that's very challenging for them to produce, but there is incredible acidity. So I don't, I'd like to go check out Nova Scotia and Tasmania. Cool yeah. Places. Yeah. So I, I think we need to know a lot more about Burgundy, frankly. And so we could do a lot more time there. And then certainly I, I love the whole idea of Tasmania. That sounds awesome. And I, you know, I don't do, I don't really do bucket lists all that much because 
Um, there's so many places to see. <laughs> so um, I think we just need to continue. Um, once the kids are probably out, it'll be yeah, easier yeah. to travel. Take them with you. But, uh, <laughs> well, listen, Lisa and Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we go, can you just remind our listeners how they can find you and your wines? And can they come visit here? I know we have a little noise in the background because we have visitors. So <laughs> how can we get more people here? Yeah. So uh, www.cdtvineyard.com. So that's singular. Um, yeah, I think that's the best way is to just visit the website. Notice how you can come out if you need assistance in planning a trip out into the valley or whatever. Reach out. Um, there's so much that's offered here that's not just about the wine, it's about the food as well and about the overall experiences. Um, and then. And your tasting room is open seven days a week? Yeah. Yep, we're open 11 to 5, seven always, days a week. And if it doesn't work for that schedule, I mean, always by appointment. Pick the phone up, give us a call. You know, we're happy to open the doors or to welcome you on days that, you know, are times that might not fit within that, that, that time frame. Yep. Well, fantastic. Well, I think everyone should come up here to the heart of the earth because it is beautiful. We're on a hill looking out at the valley, beautiful vineyards. It's a charming little winery as you walk up like a, like a, a country house. And um, I hope more people will come up here. And thank you so much for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.